the pandemic uh, pre preprints in particular, I do, before we get started, want to acknowledge a few things, which is um, the first and foremost being obvious that um, discussing this on a day like today is really difficult, uh, given the fact that we do believe that all eyes should be on um, what's happening in Minneapolis and the Floyd protests. So uh, feel free to um, watch this later and another time. WGBH is going to be recording it and uh, it'll be available on YouTube and we will get you the links to that. Uh, but at the same time, if you do stick around with us, which I, I hope you do, um, I, I want to let you know that um, there's going to be a link in the chat that you can take a look at that is uh, medium.com forward slash big if true that gives you uh, an explanation of how to interact with the webinar that we're doing today. And so some of the things that you should be aware of is that down at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A button and you can uh, click that and add a question and uh, we will try, I will try to weave it into the larger conversation. Also over on the WGBH YouTube page, there is a discussion and you can uh, also feel free to discuss over there. Today, we are gonna be speaking with a few um, very interesting scholars who are really uh, in the middle of what's going on right now. We're welcoming uh, panelist Dr. Jeremy Faust, who's a physician and editor-in-chief of Brief 19, which is a daily review of COVID-19 research and communication. We also have with us Jasmine McNeely, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for a couple of years now, uh, who is an attorney uh, and a professor at the University of Florida who studies digital communication, um, but also has a blossomed into a bit of a, a jack of all trades, looking at internet studies and uh, a lot of different things and also has some really interesting work on privacy, which I think we do need to think a lot about in this moment because of what's coming our way in terms of contract contact tracing and sort of the digitization of our medical identities. And last but not least, and one of my older and dearest friends, Irene Pasquetto, um, has been with us uh, at Shorenstein for a couple of years now and is the founder and editor-in-chief of the Harvard Kennedy School Misinformation Review and has been overseeing a special issue for the last couple of months on COVID-19. And we've had an incredible number of submissions and um, only a few publications, which is usually how it works uh, with academic journals. And so she's been the one that has been incredibly responsible for uh, the quality of the research that we've been putting out. And so uh, that has been uh, a joy to be able to work with her uh, on, on that project. And one of the things I think we should think about as we start to reimagine science in a pandemic is speed versus accuracy. There's a big trade-off right now happening where um, we have reports of nearly, I want to get these numbers right, some re reporting has stated that the COVID-19 literature has grown to more than 31,000 papers since January, and one estimate says the pace, if it continues, will be close to 52,000 papers by June. And that is probably one of the biggest explosions in scientific literature ever uh, in terms of the amount that is coming out, the speed at which it's coming out. And the fact is most of us, a lot of people probably don't even know this about the scientific process, but when someone submits an article to a journal, you as a professor or graduate student may be asked to review it and you do that work for free uh, you do that as a service to your intellectual community. And what that does, among some really negative things, where it puts gatekeepers in place and there's certain kinds of paradigms that take shape that maybe need to be uh, destabilized, right? That there's ways in which, you know, because it's always been done this way, we will continue to do it this way kind of science that takes over, but the, the good piece about anonymous peer review is that as an author, you get feedback, you have a chance to revise if you're on the right track, 
and it does lead to what we would consider quote unquote better science. But in this moment, the WHO has said that this moment is an infodemic. We are facing an overabundance of information, both good and bad. And so our role as educators and as um, people who are managing scientific knowledge in this moment have to think about these trade-offs where there's going to be bad science, uh, but we also can't let bad science be the only story that we tell about science in this moment. But because of the amount of preprints that are out there, it, it's astonishing to think about how the preprint world has really taken shape and taken the lead in driving conversation about what's important about COVID-19, what the data looks like, and as well as how the science on COVID-19 is going to progress. And so to get started, I would love to uh, kick it over to you, Jeremy, and to talk a little bit about the history of Brief 19 and what it is that you all do over there, how uh, are people in your community receiving the work that you're doing, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Brief 19 was started on a whim because I needed it. I needed really smart people to help me understand the fire hose of information that was coming out that you just described. To, to sift through the, the peer review literature and the literature that was in preprint, which was, will be peer reviewed ostensibly, and to know what's going on. And this is a, a daily blog that is written by frontline physicians, but it's written for, and it's written for our colleagues, but it's also written for the general reader. So we have a, a responsibility to try to inform everybody and, and to walk that line. And I needed it because there's just, as you say, there's just too much to keep up with. And I became increasingly concerned as I've been for many years that by the time information reaches the general um, reader, it's already been sort of through the system that creates many of the problems that we, we identified today within and without uh, the peer review literature. So we wanted to, in this very important moment, cut out the, the, the middleman, so to speak, and just get right to the readers and try to get ahead of, of myths and problems before they became ensconced. And I think what this gets at is the larger point that maybe you're alluding to, which is how do we how do we obtain knowledge? How is knowledge canonized? And how is knowledge packaged? And this project has really enlightened but also confirmed many suspicions that I've had about that. So it's it's very important. I, I think that preprints have an, an incredibly powerful opportunity. And as you say, they have a lot of danger. But I would also, as we as we develop the conversation, I would apply that some of those same exact problems. In, into the peer review literature as well. We've been seeing this for years. This is just in a way a microcosm of, of that process. Although there are some exquisitely interesting, in my opinion, um, challenges that are a little bit different in each, in each of them. And they're both their opportunities as well. I, I just, I think though that thinking about this question, it's, it's, I'm glad we're thinking about it. It's the, it's, the, it's the apotheosis of nerdiness, but it's also thinking about how we know things what could be more important than that? So, especially in this moment, because what we what we think we know will literally determine how the rest of this crisis unfolds. Yeah, I I think I when I hear you talk, you know, more bluntly about epistemology, right? How we know what we know. What is one of the things that I think that you're pointing to in terms of how does this knowledge get packaged has a lot to do with journalism. And Jasmine is um, a professor in a journalism department. And I'm wondering, Jasmine, you've written a bit about how um, journalists need to provide context and they need to be able to provide that, that nuance in their, in their articles. And um, in your predictions for 2020 in the Neiman Lab, you, you wrote about the importance of context uh, in journalism today especially in moments where people are really trying to make predictions, uh, you know, aspirational kinds of predictions. And for me, I'm uh, as much as what I study is um, a hellscape, I'm an eternal optimist. And so, and I see that it comes through in my writing. It does, uh, even when it shouldn't. And so I'm wondering for you around this, can you talk a bit about why context is critical and where 
journalists may, you know, find, um, find either, you know, guidelines or help or any kind of way in which journalism should be rethinking the preprint in this moment? Yeah, so context is important because it shapes what it is that we know, right? So you can't say we actually know anything without uh, having all the things that are connected to it, the history, the experience, the settings, the, the um, in this case, the uh, institutions where the researchers are, what are the constraints or, or lack of restraints on them? What are the pressures on them? Like all of these things matter to even the very words that we choose when we write an article. So all of these things matter. Context matters because it shapes our perspectives. It shapes how things come out. It shapes how audiences then receive that information and then go about using it or, or applying it to their lives. It's not just that we have these words, people did stuff in a lab and then they're just giving it to us because this is what happens. No, this is how they saw it happen or perceived it happening or think it should, this is the way they should write it to get it published in a certain way happen, right? All of these things matter to the information that audiences, whether it's the regular person reading the newspaper uh, and an article written about a study um, perceives it, but also how the journalists take it, how then policymakers take it, which is really important, and, and other people. So context matters, language matters, right? I'm muted. Let me add one layer to this, um, because where I think journalists are getting their context from is the fact that this stuff is coming out and it'll have credentials attached to it, right? It'll be coming out of a university. And I just want to say uh, quickly, I'll bring in the study probably most famously known in this moment around hydroxychloroquine and this, the rush to judgment about this being what Trump described as a game changer I immediately was very confused when a small study started to gain so much attention. It was, you know, maybe uh, uh, an N of 20. There were 20 participants in total. Half of them or some of them had already backed out. Some of them died and they weren't even counted in the results. But because there were credentials, because a journal had published it, and I think has now since retracted that article, that initial one on hydroxychloroquine, um, what changes there? Like, should journalists trust that? Or is there another way in which we should be approaching credentials and context in this moment? Yeah, you know, I mean, so as a PhD, I don't know if you want me to be like, yeah, don't trust the PhDs, what do they know? But I will say that uh, it, there's a couple of things, right? So what we're thinking about is what is expertise and do we trust people who have presumably gone through a whole lot of school and, and uh, gotten these degrees, presumably know how to do this kind of research or should just uh, journalists and other people, quite frankly, question? I would say journalists need to question. I mean, just because we have PhDs, law degrees, just because we have, just we have finished some kind of schooling, have some kind of a certification, it means nothing if we're not putting out um, correct stuff, right? And, and mm -hmm. that's a journalist's job, is to question. Doesn't mean that they're saying that they're automatically wrong, but they are, they are digging into what is what it is that we uh, know. That's yeah, and I think that's a good point is that journalists, uh, as they're embarking through this, what I find to be a maze, I mean, I'm really thankful for places like Brief 19 where I can um, create, you know, have a little bit of a shortcut to knowing what I should pay attention to, but it's hard for journalists. And I think that there's an, there's a, there's some kind of relationship, I, I think, to what's happening in the preprint world around unsubstantiated claims and the way that we see misinformation get taken up. Not necessarily disinformation, which involves more planning and st strategy, but health misinformation is something that is starting to percolate and come to the, the top because people are trusting these preprints that they haven't fully gone through 
uh, a, a different kind of vetting process. So journalists do have to be a, a bit more credulous in, in thinking through not just who wrote the paper, but who funded it, uh, where is it published, if it's in this archive and doesn't seem to support be supported by any other claims, uh, then we should double check and, and go back and try to unpack and, and understand that. Um, Arena, I wanted to talk to you a bit about, well, before I ask you a, a more pointed question, I'd love to hear about your experience related to the Harvard Kennedy Misinfo Review. If you could describe a bit about what it is and then talk a little bit about the special issue that you've been putting together and how, how that's been going. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, I'll do that in a second. Um, I just want to jump on and add something about how journalists should cover or could cover preprints. Um, because I've been thinking a lot about it, and I'm, I see that uh, in many are creating tip sheets for uh, journalists on how to cover science, right? And I think that's all great. Um, but um, at the same time, I don't think the journalist or is the journalist's job to try to really evaluate the science and find the facts in the preprint or in the, uh, or in the papers. It's much better, uh, at least in my opinion, to try to describe the process that goes into creating uh, that paper. And then I also have uh, one suggestion that I think uh, could work uh, quite well, at least in my experience as an editor. So um, if I was a journalist, I would just call or I would start by calling the authors of the, of the paper and ask them about the limitations of their own papers, the limitations and what is left to do. If the author cannot articulate the limitation of their papers and they get defensive and they're just gonna try to sell you the facts and whatever they are, you know, they're trying to argue in their paper, it means that those are not professionals and you shouldn't cover the paper. And that would be a very initial, I think, um, the like starting point to understand if you can or not trust that science that you put outside because every professional knows that you have to be very you know self-critical and every professional who wants to engage and is used to engage in peer review would be able to articulate this sort of like self-critique uh, and it would be very transparent about the limitations of the paper so i just thought that this kind of like approach to be very good for journalists uh, to start with. I don't know what the other panelists think about it. Uh, just an idea, <laughs> just that. Mm -hmm. so. um, in terms of the misinformation review, yes. So we are working towards this model of uh, fast reviewing articles, which basically means that we are trying to publish articles about a month after submission um, and still re peer reviewing the articles. So as jo uh, John was saying, the main problem of the peer review system is that it's low and it is low because um, I think there are two problems. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, most reviewers are not compensated for their work. And then the other problem is that most reviewers, they have full-time jobs. So they do it you know, during weekends, in the evenings, we all know how it works. So the main challenge of the peer review system is that we need to professionalize the peer reviewers. It has to be a profession as a, you know, a funder, for example, a program officer. We don't expect the full-time professors to be program officers, right? Um, so, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, how can we expect full-time professors to be um, reviewers and to actually work at the fast pace that science is requiring today. So that's, that's the main challenge that we are trying to address uh, with the misinformation review. So we are compensating our reviewers. Uh, thank you for the, I mean, we are very grateful to our funders that allows us to do this. Um, and then the other thing that we are doing, we are also trying to maximize the visibility uh, of the, um, of the papers, uh, um, really trying to work on the language and how we present the science in a way that is made uh, as easily as possible accessible to non-specialists, kind of like Jeremy was also uh, saying. Uh, that's really important to us because uh, one thing that I'm noticing, especially among young generations and new generations of the researchers is that they are not in the game of science just for their social status or the job security. 
they are in it for the impact. There, there is also like a fame, a glory, some sort of component that people really care about. Um, and so we are trying to help scientists to gain the visibility, you know, good scientists uh, that they, they deserve. Um, so, and I'm gonna stop here now. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, hat tip to trying to get journalists to call the, the authors. Um, you know, one of the things that's, I think, tricky about the way that we, ha the way that us on the panel here have relationships to uh, our fields is that when we do get invited to write a paper, a re review a paper, we're obviously not supposed to know who wrote it. Um, and the field of preprints has introduced another complexity to that where sometimes science can go public very quickly, become a very hot button issue before it's, you know, reached that, you know, journal threshold where they're ready to send it off. And so anonymization then becomes quite um, impossible or re-anonymization. Um, but before getting into that, Jeremy, I wanted to ask you a bit about, you've identified another issue that seems to have come out of um, the research that you've been doing around the need for more COVID testing. And you recently published in USA Today about how one of the most significant ways to break the chain of transmission is going to be to have robust symptom-free testing. And this is interesting. Um, the producer on this, uh, Big If True, Nicole Weaver, has pointed out to me that it's similar to the uh, parallels with misinformation and disinformation. That is like, once the damage is spread, it's almost impossible to contain it. So once disinformation or medical misinformation is out there, it's really hard to pull it back in and to, and, to, and to deal with that. And I'm wondering, I mean, this is just this is kind of a selfish question, but I don't always get to talk to medical doctors. So, But w what are we in for right now in this moment from your point of view where things are starting to reopen? We've got massive protests I think these protests are going to spread to other cities. At the same time, we are still in the midst of a pandemic where we do not have a treatment nor a vaccine. And so the conditions that were um, last month's conditions seem to still be today's conditions, other than that people have more awareness and are wearing masks. But that's not going to stop the virus from spreading. And so I'm wondering, from your point of view, as we start to reopen, enter into summer, uh, what should we be thinking about? How, do, how are we going to handle what looks like will be a second wave of this? And, um, you know, how as academics can we best participate, raise awareness, and help with what is going to be waves both of the virus and of misinformation? Thanks. I think you, the, if you could write your next dissertation on that, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I'll just this maybe later today I'll get that done. Um, I think that what's the first thing that I would say to help everybody everybody frame what's coming is probably to do something a little unexpected maybe and to ignore any predictions and models. Models and predictions are, have have way too many what we call random effects early in the model things can go one way or the other. And the, the analogy that I would use is when I say, okay, I'm gonna go from my home to my office, uh, Waze or Google Maps tells me it'll be 20 minutes. But, it, and the, 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 the closer I get to the, my destination, the more accurate that prediction is, right? So it doesn't know that there's a garbage truck um, blocking my driveway. So that just made my estimate totally wrong. So most of the models that we're hearing about have those problems, which is why some no less than Dr. Anthony Fauci was up there in early April putting numbers out that today seem very naive. So what I, what I say when people say what's next is look less at the future and more at what's actually happening because we can't even seem to agree upon that. And the, the number one way that we can agree on what's actually happening now is to get a better sense of testing. So uh, two, three months ago, I wrote a piece that said, test every American. Let's just test them all the time. Let's just do this. Let's find out where it is and we can do this. And I think that would been, that's the best way. We have shown political um, will to suggest that we aren't going to do that. We're, we're just not gonna do that. That is a tremendous um, admission of defeat 
and it's extraordinary, but it's the reality. So what, what Harlan Kremlitz and I wrote about and a few others have written similarly is to say, well, let's test smartly. Let's use our tests to uh, almost the way people who are doing elections use tests. You don't just ask everyone in a grocery store. No, no, you do a random sample that's been sort of studied by statisticians to say, okay, this will actually be a good sample. This will tell us where the problem is. And especially with, with, with asymptomatic symptom free folks who don't know they're going to spread it. So that's my approach is to the way to know what's going to happen uh, in the future is um, for your, your viewfinder to be focused about a day or two ahead, maybe a week at most, but not two months, six months or a year because we just, we have no idea how this is going to play out. In, in 1918, there was a big spike in the spring. And then I don't think they knew there was gonna be a huge spike in October and November as there was, that was five times greater or something like that. Is what we just saw the, 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 the preamble or because it was kind of late in the, in the cold and flu season, was that the big one? Who knows? We know this isn't going away. We know that our policies are pretty, um, pretty meager and we have a lot of work to do, but I don't think we know the, the scale of this. Um, but to, and then to wrap it up with the sort of, how do you cover it? this in the, in, in the media and the press, and also how do I get my physician colleagues to, to, to read properly, which essentially is the project. Um, it's a really a framework issue. I think if you read mainstream science media reporting, it's basically 80% yay, science, good news, uh, and then the kicker is sort of like, oh, but by the way, it's kind of complicated. Mm. Here's, mm -hmm. a, here's a skeptic at the end to say that, eh, not so sure. Um, and whereas with, with Brief 19, I almost think that we take that and we just reverse it. We say, okay, here's what came out and what does this possibly mean other than nothing? Let's assume it means nothing. And it's so the null hypothesis in science, right? That there's, mm -hmm. this is actually false. And let, let's see if we can't find something redeemable here that moves the ball forward. And I think that's the framework that we're working with and that we think is actually fresh and, and important. Yeah, and it reminds me too, um, you know, um, I got sick quite a few years ago and was in a doctor's appointment. The doctor pulled out her phone and started looking something up. And I was like, please tell me you're not Googling my symptoms because I just, I can't handle this right now. She was like, no, no, look at this. I have an app. It's called Up to Date. And it just, it's all, you know, if I'm going to give you this medicine, I need to look it up to date just to make sure X, Y, and Z is happening. So within the field of medicine, you, you know, some of these communication issues have been solved for. There is a very robust architecture around pharmacology, at least, where if something is going to be prescribed or a disease has already been um, really canonized and dealt with and, and uh, has frontline treatments, that it's very accessible and very easy to get at that information. And I think that Brief 19 in that model does a good job of saying, well, this is what we know right now. And I, you know, and it's commendable to me that you write it in a way that others can read and don't necessarily have to know, you know, which part of the gene this medicine is, right. is targeting. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I really appreciate that approach. And I think that it's complicated though, by folks who, when we add more context, might be junior scholars that are not going to be able to get their paper peer reviewed very quickly. Or, um, and Jasmine, you've talked a little bit about in the past about the understanding the kind of pressures that scholars are going through in this moment to get information out. I know that uh, even with the Harvard Kennedy School, there's a there's a really great dedicated resources page where you can find out what's happening at Harvard related to COVID-19. Um, and of course we get no, you know, nobody's sending me an email being like, listen, Joan, you haven't been on that website in three days, but uh, it, there is some kind of, you know, internalized pressure that you do get. If you have a piece of information that you're evaluating, you want people to see that, but it's, um, it's really tricky to figure out where to, where to publish and how to get it read. Um, and so Jasmine, if you wanna talk a little bit about some of those complications and those pressures uh, as you see them. Yeah, so like even in a pandemic, like the hunt for um, top 10 research university status doesn't go away. And so there are still pressures on faculty and staff and researchers, postdocs, graduate students, 
um, to make sure that they are making the reputation of the university great. Um, and so having, I, I believe almost every large public and the privates have a page of experts on COVID-19 for um, press folks. Um, and they send out like, these are, the, these are our researchers who are doing work in this space. Um, and so what does that mean? It means like if you're named as a researcher doing work in this space, you need to have research in this space. And that could be a preprint, but it could be something that you've been doing for a while now. But I, we need to consider all of the things. So con why context matters? We need to consider all of the pressures that are on researchers to put out work as quickly as possible. So it's not just about getting possibly scooped by another research team, but it's also about can you draw attention to yourself because attention is what matters for things like tenure, right? One of the questions is, are you known in your field? How do you get known in your field? You publish papers, you present at conferences, people point to you and cite you, right? How do you get cited? You publish stuff or you have mm -hmm. stuff up that can be cited. So all of these are pressures placed on researchers across all fields, not just like straight up STEM, social sciences too, engineering, that's mm -hmm. STEM, but whatever. Um, yeah. But yeah. also humanities and the various different kinds of things that we call humanities, all feel these pressures to put out stuff. Yeah, and then, yeah, if mm -hmm. I may, I just wanna to add to that, that also this rush to publish uh, COVID-19 publications and all the journals working really hard to fast track the science of COVID-19 publications created this uh, absurd situation in which it's almost impossible to get a paper that is not about COVID-19 into a journal because now all the journals are prioritizing this topic, you know, for social scientists, for everybody, it's like that. So basically either you write about it or you can forget about be published or be reviewed for the next, uh, I don't know, I don't know how long, long time though. So that's uh, also another downside is that. Well, let's, let's yeah. follow up on that theme, which is basically, yes, I mean, everybody wants to know more and it's, it's really been interesting. I was talking with uh, an old friend who's going to be writing some new pieces and wants to talk about, you know, things that are different than COVID-19, but knows that if they want to place their essays, it's going to have to have a uh, hook or a lead that comes from that, that um, this, this moment that we're in. And I also feel like so it can go either way. I think sometimes it's an opportunity, but then for some of us, there's a real um, desire to be part of the world as it's working, right? And sometimes it can feel really alienating to be working on the passion project that you have. Like in my mind, if I were to really just study whatever I wanted to study, like if I didn't, if I didn't give a crap about anything happening in the world, I'd be writing the best book on Stephen King and science and technology studies. Like, I mean, he has, he's, he invented the self-driving car, you know, there's lots of different story with Christine, you know, with lots of different stories, lots of different themes. Right. But if I, if I had my way, if I was really uh, acting in a very selfish mode, I, that's what I would be doing. That's how I spend my time. Right. But instead, I think, and this is true with people in the misinformation field in particular, is that we feel a very big duty to be present and acting on the problems that are happening right now. And I think in terms of medicine as well, people are, you know, it's everything we know has to change because of a pandemic. And there has to be new ways of thinking and new ways of ordering science and new ways of knowing and new ways of of learning um, in this moment. And I think that there is this desire to be present and be part of it. But at the same time, if you do want to carry on with your vanity project or the project that was just your passion point before this, that does matter, right? <laughs> like, I don't have to point out the one in my mind that really wouldn't benefit anybody other than me. But, um, you know, there's a lot of scholarship that needs to happen. There's a lot of things we still have left to know. And I think that one of the things that draws us into the world of research is the puzzle, is the not knowing, is the, is the uncertainty. And you get used to the 
the the pace of that and then a pandemic hits and it's like well we want to know everything you know right now and so let me ask you a bit about that lag time in the peer review process you know jeremy i wanted to ask you you know should we have this much faith in the peer review process anyway and is there a better way we should be thinking about it and Adena, i'm going to go to you next with the very same question the peer review process is the best and the worst thing ever it's fantastic because it has all this all these levers of, of checks and balances and all these advantages and also at the end of it people think that it's true and that it, it no longer needs to be vetted one of the one of the great things about the preprint revolution is that it, it reminds me a little bit of the way people think on April Fool's Day it's the one day of the freaking year when people think critically and say wait this might not be true right it's April 1st well guess what every day is April Fool's Day and the, the way to approach, um, the way I teach approaching peer review literature is actually for physicians and my colleagues is actually pretty much the same way I approach the preprint, which is it's, it's, it should be evidence-based, not eminence-based. So you try to ignore who wrote it and just look for a good technique. Um, and that's, that's apparent to anyone who knows the field. And then don't, don't, I don't care what they, what they say in the prose. I really don't. I, I go right to the methods and I go right to figure one and figure two. Figure one says who the patients were. Are they similar enough? Are they not in each group? Was there a control group? Uh, that kind of thing. And usually figure two is where the money is. Was there a difference with this drug? What happened? And if I can't tell immediately that, that what's going on, then I have to zoom out and decide, okay, is this because I don't know what I'm doing and I need to, I need to know more to analyze this? Or is this because they are engaging in what my friends would call statistical chicanery and that they are confusing even me? Um, and it's a little bit of both, right? And you have to know where your limits are. So when I, so the preprint comes out and I see data, it's, I take it as highly unlikely that these are deep fakes right, that someone just going up and making stuff up. And I think that if that, and the reason I think that is that the, the, the community is small enough that even if you had seen like a leak, like the like the, um, the, the study from China on remdesivir that was leaked, right, there's a screenshot. It, I took one look at that and I said, that looks legit. You know, the only way that that's fake is if someone went to great lengths to fake that thing. And if that's the case, the, the, the authors will not be silent. Their silence will not be just whatever. They'll say, ah, no, that is that has nothing to do with our study. We'll be publishing soon. So um, I, I look at these, at the data themselves as being reliable in and of themselves. And then when you look at the pros, that's where you get into trouble. I can't tell you how many times I've read studies that I thought concluded were negative. And yet the industry funded authors concluded that it was positive because as the old saying goes, if you torture the data enough, it will eventually confess. So I think the preprint revolution gives us, gives us an opportunity to double down on the right way to read a paper and to remind ourselves that just because it appears, something eventually appears in the peer review literature doesn't make it right, doesn't mean it's not still right for, for, for a takedown. Uh, but, but again, that, that process can also lead us forward with great knowledge. So I'm not, you know, I read the New England Journal of Medicine, but I don't believe everything it always says. Mm -hmm. Reina? Yeah, um, so first of all, I wanted to say that I was very envious while I was um, listening to Jeremy explaining how we, uh, it's relatively straightforward to, uh, I think, to evaluate um, like a hard science paper. You look at the methods and figure one, figure two. I wish so much that it was so simple or at least similar in social science. You know, like you have to consider so many other con contextual factors, politics, uh, economics, uh, geographical locations, uh, locality, historical factors. So. It's, um, yeah, I was very envious about that. Um, yeah, um, what do you want me to talk about, John? Well, just if the, should we trust this peer review process that, you know, it takes a long uh, time. Does it, does it produce, you know, what we might consider better science? Yeah, so I love the peer review process in all of this. Uh, seeing it uh, happening, it's just, uh, it just such a nice, beautiful, activity um, and I think there are a lot of very good peer reviewers there are a lot of academics that really believe in the peer review process so I would never radically change it actually as I was saying my opinion should be just become more professionalized and uh, ideally publicly funded uh, but I would I would not say that you know we should like completely change it or... uh, one one thing I had mm -hmm. also 
another crazy thought. And I think we have to watch out for preprints and how and what they are becoming for journalists, especially as sources. Because uh, just yes yesterday I was thinking about that. I have the feeling that preprints now are becoming for uh, um, science journalists, uh, what blogs uh, were uh, in 2010 for journalists, you know, like kind of like this place where I just kind of like go and report maybe sometimes uncritically. And so that could be a real problem. Yeah, because I think, you know, there's also another model to think with here, which is something like the computer science model of preprints or printing, which is basically your conference paper is your publication, right? So if it goes through and it gets vetted and it's accepted to the conference, then it's considered a publication and that's that. And in social sciences, basically your conference paper is your draft that you wrote on the plane ride to the conference. I'm not going to confess to doing that, but if, you know, if the only barrier barrier to entry is a 250 word abstract, that abstract is going to slap, like it's going to be great, but the paper is probably not probably not going to be ready yet. Um, and, you know, and that's just sort of the way in which the social science field has dealt with this. And I think that medicine strikes a good balance of having some of the the public the proceedings of conferences be publications and and but uh, with computer science uh, in that field it does seem to really allow them to to publish very quickly about new uh, findings and and new schemas and and to do the kind of robust um, review and acknowledge and acknowledging the shortcomings and the limitations without really kind of shooting for the moon and I think part of it has to do with the culture also is, you know, the, the language of publication is always really difficult to understand. You have to be an insider to really be able to access this. And I'll just add one little anecdote about a preprint that I had done with my co-author, Aaron Panofsky. We we're getting ready for the ASA, uh, American Sociological Association annual meeting, and it was uh, happening in... August of uh, 20, this was 2017, 2018. Um, and right, uh, we put the paper up for preprint because we were giving a presentation about it, wanted people to be able to access it. But it ended up landing on the same weekend as the Unite the Right rally. And our paper was about white supremacist use of DNA ancestry tests. So immediately a paper that was meant for our community of scholars to help us re-engineer the whole uh, look and feel of the paper to make sure that our findings were understandable that landed within the literature then became news and it really went out of our control very quickly luckily we had worked quite a bit on the paper and the preprint was um, way too long that was sort of like the most harsh feedback we got was like can you shorten this uh, but it did, it was a little scary. I'm not going to lie. It was like, well, this is the first time we're putting this into the world. We want feedback from our colleagues. And here we are now talking to, you know, ABC news or the New York times. And so it was very, um, it was very interesting, but also I think part of it is, is that you catch the wave in the moment. And that moment right now is COVID-19 and we are in the midst of, uh, a, a really big knowledge gap and deficit here uh, in terms of what we need to know and what we, we currently know. And Jasmine, I wanted to ask you a bit about where you think this all is not necessarily is going. I don't want to ask you to make a pr prediction, but in this moment, if it is by June, we have 52,000 preprints of papers out there in this field. And, it, you know, as a communication scholar, does a whole new discipline develop? Does a whole new like hybrid field start to emerge out of this? Like, you know, because I, I can imagine 52,000 papers, they're not all science, right? They're not all social science. They're not all commuter science. Like we've got people developing all kinds of different technology related to this. Does this, does this signify a kind of paradigm shift or what do you think? Especially like thinking about health research in general too. Yeah, so I don't know if it signifies a paradigm shift. I think it certainly um, amplifies issues that have been bubbling in, in scholarship for a while. I, I believe like the scholarly communication researchers would say, oh, this has been coming 
probably for a long time. But just as a as a like a broader, I guess, more general uh, twenty thousand foot view, like all of this, like all of the information that we get is political, right? And so uh, in the United States, we say that we let all, or at least we want to let all of this information, this communication into the marketplace of ideas so that people can choose for themselves what it is they'll believe, right? What's true for them. So I think for scholarship, there's that aspect of it. At the same time as scholars, we have kind of responsibility, usually, right? With respect to the kinds of things that we publish. Now, whether or not that actually works out in practice is a different thing, but we are supposed to have a duty to do the very best as far as methods, the very best as far as communicating, um, the very best as far as, um, particularly for many of the large public universities, making our uh, research applicable to broader audiences, the public, and making an impact on the public. What that actual impact is, is, is open for debate. But like all of this is political. And so when we start talking about political speech and what we do with political speech, we get into a realm that's um, fraught with, you know what? All of this has to be let in. All of this mm -hmm. has to be out there because that's what we staked our all on in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, you know, something that Arena was getting at here that <sighs> makes me think a lot about misinformation too is that journalists are going to be enticed by the novel finding, the outlier, the thing that no, no one else is saying is, is, or no one else is studying or no one else is corroborating. And and um, and Jasmine, earlier you alluded to the idea that you know you could get scooped by another researcher, and and what's you know like what we know about at least good science is that everybody finds the same thing, right? They try the same thing, they look for the same thing, they find the same thing, and then suddenly you know a rock is a rock and a tree is a tree, and and we 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 go from there. Um, and it's different, of course, when we start to think about society because society is so messy and and politics too and the politicization I guess the one thing I would like to close out on is to thinking about the politicization of science in this moment and how troublesome it's going to be getting at facts knowing that there are different political factions that believe vehemently that things like wearing a mask is um you know, uh, somehow harming you more than not wearing a mask, and that social distancing is a is a hoax, for instance. Uh, so there's different political factions that that my team looks at every day that wonders quite quite a lot about the the future of a kind of collective approach to this given the fact that like political polarization is playing such a big role in how we understand science in this moment and Jeremy I wanted to go to you for some closing thoughts on how you uh, are tackling this politicization of science are you just uh, you know keeping keeping on the tr the track that you know and, and doing the work that you do the research that you do and and um, you know, it's going to fall where it may, or are you thinking more about what kind of alliances you might need to draw together with government agencies, health agencies, public health advocates to deal with, like what you've talked about earlier around, we need much more contract tracing. And the only way to get that is with the right kind of political uh, will and the kind of resources that we're going to need, because contact tracing isn't an app. It's a uh, industry in a lot a lot of ways there's a, a lot of people that need to be involved well I've, over the years i've watched various parts of science come under attack by being politicized so it it, it was somehow political to, to 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 notice that we have genes and that we have dna it was somehow political to notice that there's climate change um and and wait what there's climate change what happened allegedly yeah. Oh, okay. um, 
but what I haven't seen until now is um, the, the, pol the, the politicization of medicine in quite this way. There's certainly been a struggle between maybe systems of belief in terms of for-profit versus non-profit endeavors having different viewpoints on science. That's sort of, maybe that was the sort of skirmish for mm -hmm. the war that's breaking out right now in which you literally have um, people saying, oh, that study is a fake because the, the Veterans Administration is out to get me, um, you know, quoting, you know, paraphrasing the, the president on hydroxychloroquine. So we, we now are, now medicine gets to join its fellow um, colleagues in science as living in this world in which um, we have, this is the lens that we're going to have to look through things. And the challenge there, I think, is, as you say, do you, do you soldier on and just try to pretend that's not going on? Or do you sort of acknowledge it and just try to present the facts as they are? I think um, it, it, the facts are the facts. You can't, you can't twist those if you do the right studies. But I do think the kinds of questions you ask will be informed by that. So we see, for example, hydroxychloroquine prescriptions are much, much higher than, than they were a few months ago, up um, you know, 2,000% almost in some cases. Uh, it's unbelievable. Um, and then the question is, well, should we start to look and see if that's actually being, is that a red state, blue state thing? And if so, let's understand why people uh, are doing what they're doing. So I think it informs research questions. And, in, in, and it's unfortunate that we're gonna have to spend a lot of our time thinking about those issues, but there's now a new lens through which we have to ask questions. And I think if we don't do that, essentially it'll get siloed off and half the people will just ignore what you say. And I think that would not be a safe situation. So it's just a matter of uh, acknowledging that we are now just like our colleagues in other fields and to start to approach those things. And I think the best way to do that is not to shrug them off um, as ignorant or as, as not meaning well, um, even though in some cases that is the case, uh, but it's not always the case. A lot of cases, it really comes out of a, a, a framework that we just need to understand more clearly. I'll give you a brief example, I'll wrap up. You know, why do so many people in, in uh, red states think that influenza is, is worse than COVID-19, even though we've got data to say that that's not true. And the answer is that in a lot of those states, COVID-19 just hasn't killed that many people. So from their framework, it, it, that, that factual information doesn't make any sense. So we have to just address those realities when we ask questions going forward. Great. Edena, any uh, closing thoughts on where, where we go next or anything about yeah. the, the journal we should know? And uh... you know, My closing thought is that another profession that we really need to invest on <clears throat> uh, going forward in case that <clears throat> sorry, someone is listening, our academic librarians, because we will end up with so many publications and pieces of software and data that will need curation. And the way we present those and we organize those and we archive those, it will be so important. So uh, we really need, you know, more professional academic librarians and to train new academic librarians going forward. There will be a huge demand for those professionals. No, I've been a big advocate of telling, you know, as, as we enter this, um, you know, phase 37 of content moderation discussions and waves, you know, today, of course, there's a battle of wills between Twitter and Trump, um, who will win, I think we all lose. Uh, no matter what happens, but I keep saying we can we can't have reactive content moderation. We actually have to start thinking proactively about curation of online content, and it yeah. starts with you know hiring ten thousand librarians. Yeah, and, and, absolutely agree. You know, really restructuring, radically restructuring the information delivery systems that um, we depend on every day. Um, so I very much, very much agree with you. And Jasmine, any closing thoughts or um, things you want to let people know about that are coming down the pike for you? I know that you're active in so many different ways. So, you know, and I don't always know when the hits are coming out. So. No, I would just say that um, for, to go back to the beginning, context matters here. Um, why are you know certain studies getting more attention than others? Context matters. Mm -hmm. Funding matters. Uh, institutions matter. Um, connections with journalists and media matter. Like all of those things matter. So we can't just take things out of context and expect to get answers or to be able to make frameworks for changing things. But we have to look at like what actually is happening socially, professionally, 
legally, economically, whatever the case may be, to make critical changes um, for the future. Mm. No, I, I completely agree with you. And if we had had two hours, I definitely would have started to delve into the relationship between some of these preprints and the possibilities for hoaxing journalists in the future. And we've seen a few different instances where people will say, oh, my paper's totally under review. And it's not really hard to get a paper under review. You just click submit and you get a little PDF back that says your paper's under review and it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, you know, and we've seen that happen a few times uh, and we've seen things go to press release before it went to preprint. So there's publication by press release now, which is also a very problematic way of entering into the field because that just, I mean, you know, I'm not going to say like academic Twitter is a hive of, of killer bees, but we are. And, <laughs> you know, and like, you know, if you if you do that kind of stuff, people are going to notice and they're going to, to step in and step up. But even doing, you know, that kind of critique through Twitter is hard and to do that through social media and trying to get information into the public. You know, it's it's been a real treat to talk to all three of you today, especially uh, given the fact that, you know, you you are all trying uh, in this moment to be present and accountable, but also to move, you know, however centimeter by centimeter forward our fields so that, um, you know, when it's all said and done, uh, we will have, you know, we will have tried, um, even if it is just, you know, flurries of tweets and, and volunteer labor that's mostly hidden from view. Um, so I want to say thank you, and I appreciate the time that you've spent with me today um, on Big If True. Before we close, though, I'd like to do just a 30-second um, um, moment of silence for George Floyd, knowing what's going on today is, is really uh, weighing on me, as I'm sure it is the rest of us. So if you could just hang tight with me, um, I'd appreciate it. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And for everybody that, that stayed tuned, um, I, uh, we're going to be back in two weeks with a uh, program uh, involving uh, Gabby Lim, and we're going to be talking about securitization and uh, misinformation. Thank you so much. Thank you to our today's panelists, and I will see you on the internet.